Good evening everyone and welcome to our joint webcast with the Edinburgh Lothians and Fife District Centre. We are delighted to welcome Sebastian Burnside, NatWest Group's, NatWest Group's Chief Economist, to come along and share his insights into the impacts of a turbulent 2020 on financial services and the wider economy and an outlook for 2021. I hope you enjoyed today's webcast and I'll now pass you over to Helen Mackay, Chairperson of the District Centre. Warm welcome to everyone on this chilly evening. It is in Edinburgh anyway, lots of snow today. Um, it's a pleasure to share another um, District Centre event with the Chartered Banker membership and CISI. So thanks very much for, for joining us tonight. And um, really delighted to have Seb Burnside along, um, as Heather said, from NatWest, Chief Economist. And um, he's had a very varied and interesting career to date, uh, culminating in his appointment as Chief Economist at NatWest Group, where his insights helped the bank to understand the changes needed to meet the demands of the evolving economy and customer base. He's here, this night, he's here tonight to share his insights into these in, impacts of 2020, and um, we've not exactly got off to a great start in 21 either. Um, so before um, I go on any further, I'll pass you over to Seb, and just a reminder that um, he's open to questions at the end of the presentation, so please um, submit these as you go along, or um, feel free to, to send them at the end. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction, Helen, uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, my plan is to talk to you for 25, 30 minutes or so, and then leave as much time for, uh, for questions and, and hopefully a few answers um, uh, as, uh, as you'd like uh, towards the end of that. So as Helen mentioned, um, if there's anything that occurs to you during, uh, during the discussion, then click on the Q&A button um, if you have Zoom set up on a device like mine, uh, and you can tap away uh, in there, and, uh, and hopefully we'll get we'll get around to answering everything you want to talk about. So there is rather a lot to talk about, um, and uh, as Heather mentioned, um, uh, my hope for twenty twenty one was that we would be spending a little less time talking about lockdowns and a little bit more time talking about the exit. Uh, and the recovery and the and the route back to if not if not the new normal then the new different to borrow a few people's trademarks at the moment um but um uh, we've got a little way uh, to go uh, before we can uh, before before we can firmly put the worst points uh, behind us unfortunately um but even with that um perspective it's important to recognize um the sheer scale of what the economy and what all of us have been through over the last 12 months. Um, and therefore, I want to share with you um, some materials I've, uh, I've put together uh, that help put that in context. And then we can look forward to some of the trends that we think will be significant as we grow out of this uh, and really start to shape the future of the economy um, in the hopefully many more um, somewhat more optimistic uh, years that we have to come uh, versus what we've just been through. So if the magic of the technology works, then you should now be able to see um, optimistically titled presentation called uh, The COVID Recovery. Um, but before we get to recovery, um, the scale of the shock uh, was what I first promised to talk to you about. Um, and uh, we now know that at its worst point, uh, back in April uh, 2020, uh, the economy um, shrank by roughly a quarter on its pre-COVID output levels. Now, I've been um, with NatWest and uh, Royal Bank of Scotland for um, just over a decade. And in that time, uh, we have run a whole myriad of different stress testing scenarios, um, many of which inspired by benchmarked against calibrated for uh, the experience of the financial crisis, um, which at an almost 7% decline um, felt astonishingly severe when we were living through it and certainly had um, uh, spectacularly severe financial consequences uh, for the group as was then. 
But as you can see, um, the financial crisis looks like a mere blip and one which took quite some time to actually fall to the depths of compared to the heart attack um, shape uh, that um, the global pandemic has had on, uh, on measured UK output. The good side, I guess, if you're looking for uh, if you're looking for comfort, is that whilst the growth from the depths of the financial crisis um, was really very slow and steady, there was there was very little rebounding going on. Um, we're fortunate in that, and that with the right combination of policy supports and with the natural function of uh, lots of aspects of the economy, we have much stronger aspects for our rebounding recovery from the global pandemic. Um, rather than the sluggish performers we had out of the out of the financial crisis, but um, we've still got some way to go before we get there. Uh, this is up to October data. At the end of October, we think um, output in the UK was about eight percent below uh, its pre-COVID levels. Tomorrow morning at seven a.m., for those of you um, who get up bright and early, uh, we will find out what the November GDP figures are for the UK. Um, we had hoped they would be better, but uh, most of England went into uh, some form of lockdown uh, tier four and that during, uh, during November. Uh, Scotland had tougher, albeit more, more incremental change, um, uh, uh, or more incremental changes, um, uh, and, um, uh, and therefore we expect um, that tomorrow's numbers to be negative, unfortunately. Um, so um, that's where we are. We're somewhere between 8 and 10% below the pre-COVID levels of output. But that figure masks a wide variety um, of different outcomes across the economy. That's just an average um, at the total level. Because if there's one thing which characterizes this from a business perspective, it's the hugely uneven nature of COVID. Uh, and this is a theme which we'll be coming back to um, uh, on several occasions through this discussion. Um, the most obvious place, particularly in the, from the business perspective, uh, is the differential sector impacts. So whilst the average, um, econo uh, uh, whilst the average across the economy was an 8% deficit to pre-COVID levels in October, we had still a third of leisure activity um, uh, deficient versus uh, pre-COVID, whilst at retail um, levels, all that money that wasn't being spent on leisure uh, was clearly being redirected um, and retailers, some of which are, are performing a lot more strongly than they were uh, pre-COVID. Uh, and a whole host of industries in between, as you'd expect, people like uh, uh, transport um, towards, the, towards the bottom end of the performance leap uh, in terms of sector impacts. So, excuse me, and um, that's what the recession looked like from an output and a business perspective. Um, but at its heart, we also have uh, a huge amount of impacts on people's personal finances uh, and their behaviours. And one of the uh, easiest things we can do is to show how it's affected spending. And clearly, in-person services spending has been some of the areas which is most heavily reflected, transport spending down 30% here, um, uh, uh, restaurants, hotels, and recreation, all, uh, uh, all amongst the most heavily impacted. Um, whereas there has been some shifting of that spending power into people spending more on their homes, uh, particularly doing them up, um, and food and drink consumed inside the home, clearly rising to compensate for all those lunches um, and dinners that uh, uh, that in previous years we enjoyed uh, enjoyed taking out. Um, and for anyone who's who's reading the detail of this, I can assure you that um, the alcohol and alcohol and tobacco part that is much more people buying from offline senses. Um, uh, I don't know why the ONS puts narcotics in with that, um, but that's not something which we have great data on uh, as to whether it's gone up or down uh, during this recession yet. Um, so household spending has fallen and shifted. Um, and that's had big impact on the financial situation of lots of uh, uh, lots of people across the UK. Um, in particular, it's created a uh, a real lump in um, uh, our customers, uh, and this is Bank of England data, um, in terms of what's happening with their financial situations. 
So lower spending has meant that people are borrowing less money uh, on credit cards and personal loans. And in aggregate, not true for everyone, as we'll see later, but in aggregate, um, the household sector is ended up with about 130 billion pounds more in its current accounts and savings accounts um, as a result of uh, the last 11 months um, uh, um, or growth over the last over the last 11 months, um, and that's you know, well over 100 billion more than you would expect to see um, uh, growth wise in terms of that. So, for people looking for uh, silver linings and the possibility of further catch up growth in 2021, there is clearly a lot of pent up demand and clearly a lot of financial firepower out there if the conditions are right to tempt it out. Uh, of people's wallets uh, and to get them to re-engage safely uh, with the economy. So uh, clearly some uh, some bright possibilities there. So what happens next? Um, as I mentioned, as, as Helen mentioned, we started 2021 um, really um, with a surging um, a virus situation uh, in Scotland and in the UK as a whole and across many parts of the world. Um, that West Group has a, a, a quite a major sized bank in Ireland, um, and unfortunately, uh, hence why I was looking at this chart recently, um, and Ireland's, um, uh, the pace of which uh, infections have taken off there um, has been uh, absolutely stratospheric uh, in, in recent weeks. Um, but rising cases are, um, are clearly, uh, clearly a global phenomenon uh, across much part of the world. Now, we've had lockdown um, in post since Boxing Day um, uh, in Scotland and Tier 4 across much of England uh, and corollary um, uh, policies in Wales as well. Um, so we now think we're at a stage where cases are plateauing or starting to fall. Um, Scotland's week-on-week -week cases have started falling um, uh, about five or six days ago. So lockdown is working to help bring uh, uh, those cases back, uh, back lower. But the biggest impact um, for the longer term growth, as, I'm, as in the rest of 2021 um, for the UK, is not going to be repeated lockdowns, but instead a race between infections and the vaccine. Um, fantastic news that in the UK, we now have three vaccines which have been approved by the medicines regulator uh, and are being rolled out uh, in one of the most ambitious programmes um, that, uh, that, that we've seen. And very early analysis from uh, the COVID actuaries response group, um, who are a pretty trustworthy source, can't trust everything you see on Twitter about COVID naturally, but um, some, uh, some of the best modelling that I've seen on what we can expect the impact of that vaccination program to be uh, is characterized uh, by these lines. Now, just as a reminder, um, the COVID vaccines are very rightly uh, being targeted at those who are most clinically vulnerable, either through uh, uh, underlying health conditions or by virtue of their age. And therefore, whilst the pace of vaccine rollout is only expected to have a relatively modest impact on reduction in the number of cases, the blue line, um, uh, as we reach groups one to four, which from memory is everyone over the age of 65 and, um, uh, uh, and vulnerable groups. Um, the fact is that, that, that those groups account for radically disproportionate share of people at, uh, at fatal risk of COVID. And on the basis of this modeling, at least, um, the successful immunisation uh, of those groups uh, could reduce hospital deaths um, by up to 85%. And so um, what we hope, therefore, this stylized modelling, which will presume that cases otherwise stay stable, so, we don't, uh, so you can add these falls to the impact of lockdown and bringing case trajectory downwards. What I would hope, analysing this, um, uh, this work, uh, is that we would see really material falls in the death rates um, as we get into the middle of next month. Um, so we've been breaking records at the UK and at the Scottish level um, recently. Uh, so hopefully that will be a relatively short-lived experience 
uh, and by the time we get into next month and um, those numbers are uh, whilst will still be clearly uh, high uh, will be um, uh, towards uh, less uh, uh, less clearly um, uh, negative territory and that in due course will therefore allow us to um, start to reopen the economy but the pace at which we're able to do that is still very uncertain um, whether that's because of the combination of measures that and still needed to contain cases or potentially um, complicating factors like new strains uh, we heard today about increasing concern about the strain from brazil um, that will continue to make the picture uh, lumpy uh, and uncertain and this uncertainty has been a huge feature of the COVID economic landscape. This chart is from the Office for Budget Responsibility, the UK fiscal watchdogs official forecasts, uh, and it was made in November. Um, the central forecast is this blue line, which has a fall in Q4 capturing the November lockdown um, in much of England that we talked about. Um, it will unfortunately probably have either a flat line or a bit more of a fall uh, in Q1 to capture the lockdown uh, that we're experiencing now. And the ability for those sorts of changes really underlines why this picture has been put together with such a wide swathe of uncertainty between an upside where pre-COVID output levels are reached in as early as Q3 this year, which feels, feels very optimistic sat where we are today, um, uh, versus a downside where we have uh, a deterioration next winter uh, and maybe it takes us right the way out to late 2024 to reach uh, uh, pre-COVID levels of output. Um, this is an unprecedented amount of uncertainty. Normally you would see charts like this characterized with uh, an uncertainty band of maybe three, four percentage points of GDP growth uh, in a couple of years time. Here we have a maximum gap between upside and downside of well over 10%, getting on for 15% uh, uh, at that stage. Um, and that is an unavoidable uh, uh, consequence of um, uh, the uncertainty over what we'll need to do to, in order to contain the virus uh, and the combination of how economic agents will re-engage with the economy uh, once we do uh, uh, allow them to start spending their money uh, and interacting as they a bit more like they used to do. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what's happening, um, but I feel like I've probably told you um, more about what we don't know than what we do know so far. Um, and also looking at this picture, you know, lots of businesses would perfectly reasonably say, well, how am I supposed to plan uh, um, given the wildly different outcomes uh, that you say are plausible uh, um, uh, in this outlook. Now, the approach that we've taken to this in our advice uh, for the bank and for our clients um, from the start has been that it's important to acknowledge the scale of this uncertainty. You can't get away from it. Um, the fact that we have a lockdown in Q1 um, you know, means that it's important to model downside scenarios and to understand what the implications are for your commercial plans and financial situations. Um, but at the same time, you should try to acknowledge what you do know about the way in which customers and the environment is operating and uh, is changing. So let's turn to what we do know about uh, the pandemic. And for us, there are really four key themes um, uh, that stand out as, we, as we've gone through this experience. And the first, and really the one which underpins everything else, to be honest, is an implication of COVID um, that so many areas of our lives and our interactions, there's been a step change in digitization. So for us, we're a bank, you know, clearly vast majority of our workforce are now predominantly engaging with us digitally from home. But it's also true that there's been a massive acceleration of our customers' engagement with us uh, through digital channels um, uh, to avoid the need to be face to face in branches, uh, but also uh, um, uh, from an increased convenience factor. 
And that's mirrored right the way across the economy. Um, the most visible one uh, and the most uh, the one with the greatest impact, I think, um, will be no surprise. It's the uh, change in online share of retail sales. Um, but the scale here, I think, is is worth dwelling on briefly. So the UK has always been an early adopter of internet shopping. Um, we had outside of sort of South Korea, um, one of the highest shares of goods bought online uh, in the world going into this. Um, roughly 20% um, in the start of 2020 um, of our shopping was done online. But as the first lockdown came, that shot up to over a third. Um, uh, um, clearly, as physical stores closed and it became difficult to spend in person. Now, what was really interesting over the summer, as the economy unlocked again uh, and retailers were able to operate with social distancing and, hand, and, hand, uh, and masks, but in an otherwise relatively unconstrained way, what was really interesting was uh, seeing the degree to which that jump up to a third share of, uh, of retail sales uh, moderated. And um, the degree of moderation was relatively limited. The minimum that uh, online share got to was about 27, 28%. And heading towards the end of the year, as normally does with, um, with Christmas shopping, it started climbing back up towards 30%. And so if you take 30% as the kind of the new normal, then what we're saying is we have seen online share of retail spending in the UK jump from 20% to 30% in one year, which otherwise would have taken between four and five years to achieve at previous pre-COVID trend rates of growth uh, of retail sales. So five years of change in industry compressed into one for an industry that we already would have highlighted as being one of the most structurally, most rapidly changing industries, perhaps second only to you know, electric cars disrupting automotive uh, automotive sector at the moment. So that's a gigantic pace of shift, uh, pace of adaptation that firms need, uh, firms need to deal with. And that type of digitization has um, huge knock-on impacts, even for businesses which have no connection to retail sales. Because the fact is that everyone's customers are going to be spending so much more of their time interacting digitally with all sorts of different players, from the biggest retailers in the world, to financial institutions, to government, and to all different other aspects. And I think that means that their expectations of what constitutes a good customer experience in the digital world will evolve much more rapidly as they get to experience the highs and the lows of everyone's attempts to uh, deliver uh, uh, what, they're, what they're trying to uh, for customers out there at the moment. So digitization is the, is the, uh, is the real cornerstone of the changes that we're seeing. And it's an enabler for all sorts of other things. Um, it's an enabler um, of different changes in mobility. So bottom left-hand corner, this is data from the summer, uh, but even with relatively similar levels of restrictions, UK office workers were radically less likely to be working from their offices, from their usual place of work, um, than their continental peers uh, uh, back in the summer. Whether that's to do with the fact that we have some of the longest commutes in Europe, um, we're not quite sure. Uh, we think that's probably a contributing factor. Uh, but either which way, it was a very different, stark level of behaviour. And office workers staying at home, uh, as well as other workers staying at home, has meant that there's been a big change in where people are spending their time and therefore their money. So top right-hand corner, as uh, our analysis of our data on, uh, actually this is Centre for Cities data, on where uh, activity has been taking place. And we've seen, with an example from the northwest here, you know, city centre Manchester fall off a cliff, whereas Birkenhead on the outskirts of Merseyside 
um, much more residential uh, area uh, being able to recoup some of the um, cash and time spent that uh, that people previously would have spent in Liverpool mainly, uh, but also Manchester um, as they were commuting in. And even within sectors, so even within the retail sector, we've seen changes in where people go. So shopping centres typically tend to be more city centre focused to really, really struggled, especially being inside, whereas the generous parking available at retail parks has been much more accessible through this process uh, and therefore able to keep customers, uh, uh, keep enticing customers back, uh, despite not necessarily being able to offer them a cinema or a restaurant as they would have done before. So these themes, we think, um, have been real, really strong enablers of the trends during the pandemic, but also because they accelerate factors which were already there, albeit progressing more slowly pre-COVID, um, we think they are strong enough to build a strategy around and to incorporate into your longer term planning uh, and therefore form one of the things that we can hold on to with a bit more certainty, uh, even as we go through these particularly unprecedented COVID times. But I want to delve a little bit more into, uh, into some of the differential impacts um, that we're seeing COVID have. Um, and, and lots of this is still, a, still very much a work in progress. Um, but one of the features of, of this of, uh, event is that because of digitization partly, um, our ability to access near real-time information um, is so much radically improved um, uh, uh, that we, we really have so many more tools to employ to understand um, our customers' behavior uh, and the way the economy is working as it gets affected by all these different lumps and bumps along the road. And um, there's a strong spatial element, as I referred to on the previous slide, um, but this slide really pulls it out uh, in detail. There's a very strong spatial element to this, um, about which there's a huge debate um, over the level of permanence. First of all, as I said at the start, you know, the bigger the city, the more difficulty it has in uh, terms of uh, engaging with people who used to be there. So this is city centre mobility. Um, and indexed at 100 pre-COVID. And as you can see, you know, everything fell off a cliff in the first lockdown. Um, there was some recovery in the summer, uh, but the recovery was much weaker in London than it was in any of these three uh, 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 leading Scottish cities. Some interesting differentials there about pace of recovery and uh, where, who engaged where. Um, and particularly um, in the November restrictions, you know, the central belt um, got much tighter. Glasgow, in particular, um, was in tier four uh, longer than uh, longer than the east, side, east coast, um, and so we've got some differentials there. Um, whilst Aberdeen has been able to um, uh, maintain more movement and more people uh, in its city centre proportionally uh, uh, than other than other cities at this stage. Now. Clearly, there's a lot of policy in there. There's a lot of rules which are uh, generating those changes. But you know, take a time where there weren't huge restrictions on our, on our mobility, you know, that August to September time, and ask yourself the question of you know, playing out across the different um, uh, footprint. If you're a business with lots of different places, uh, lots of different points of operations, you know, what element of that differential will be permanent? Uh, versus what would you expect to bounce back when we get to some point of normality in 2021? Um, your view on that could lead you to very different choices about what the best outcome is for your customers and for your business uh, as you proceed through that. And so lots of businesses are starting to ask themselves those questions at the moment. And their answers will have big implications for um, uh, what um, uh, sites of employment um, stay open. Uh, and where that organisation of economic activity gravitates to uh, uh, in the post-COVID world, so COVID will accelerate a lot of those, uh, a lot of those distribution plans. COVID has an impact on activity in terms of where it takes place, and um, but it also has a very strong discriminatory activity, if you like, on um, uh, impact on who bears the brunt of these changes. 
Uh, and um, the data that we have at the moment suggests that COVID is as cruel economically as it has been medically in terms of preying on vulnerabilities. So you are radically more likely to have been furloughed if you are paid within 10 or 15% of the minimum wage uh, or so uh, versus any of the other uh, higher wage bands. Um, and I referred in the um, uh, in uh, an early slide to this 100 billion pounds excess buildup in deposits of people's bank accounts that they're going to out there to spend. Well, that's clearly um, a big contribution from um, the more affluent end of society. Uh, but surprise, surprise, for people at the uh, less wealthy end of the spectrum, um, they have tended to see actually their costs rise in lockdown as they are spending more on heating uh, and electricity uh, and on food costs of being at home and particularly having children at home for longer periods. Um, uh, whilst they have saved less on discretionary travel and tourism style uh, part of their budgets um, and uh, many doing being employed in face-to-face -face op occupations uh, have not had the opportunity to save money commuting by working from home for example and those effects um, together with being most likely to have had disruptions to their income because more likely to be self-employed or more likely to be marginally attached to the work and um, to the labor force more likely to have been furloughed uh, without having their incomes topped up uh, that means that they have uh, been hit disproportionately uh, uh, and are um, uh, more likely to be negatively uh, uh, negatively affected financially uh, as a result of this and that's why you know we've got so much focus on things like um, the contingency arrangements for free school meals, uh, why there is so much focus on maintaining universal credit boost, which got implemented uh, at the start of the pandemic to try to offset uh, these sorts of effects uh, for those most vulnerable in society. Uh, and I think that um, uh, that pressure and that awareness uh, will only rise as these sorts of analysis become more mainstream uh, because uh, as it becomes even more apparent uh, of the skewed effects COVID has had uh, uh, on uh, on society. Um, but I did want to mention one point um, uh, and perhaps uh, a more optimistic point to, uh, to, to end on uh, than um, dwelling on the um, cruel effects of COVID. Um, and that is that despite you know, clearly one of the biggest economic and political challenges and uh, the world faced in 2020 and uh, being faced with the global pandemic one of society's other biggest challenges um, also saw really material progress um, over the last 12 months and we look to see that accelerating very strongly uh, in uh, uh, in 2021 as well and that is the urgent need for society and for economies to address um, the impact of climate change uh, and uh, to start to mitigate um, uh, and reverse um, the increased emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere uh, resulting in warming. Um, and this is making really, really material um, steps at the moment. So in the space of literally three weeks um, uh, in November, we saw South Korea, Japan and China um, all make net zero pledges um, for 2050 in the first two cases and 2060 for China, which is you know, later, but still gigantically important given China's status as the biggest emitter right now. Um, and that plus um, uh, President-elect Joe Biden's commitment to bring um, uh, the US back into the Paris Agreement uh, on, I think, the day after he gets inaugurated. So in about, what is it, nine days time now, um, means that we will have roughly three quarters of the world's emissions, two thirds of the world's GDP um, covered by economies that have pledges to uh, get to net zero uh, by halfway through this century, which will be a, a huge increase in level of emission 
uh, and that's shown so far. That's um, good, but what we need is more than just promises. Um, and that really is the theme of COP26, uh, for which the UK has presidency and will hopefully be taking place physically in Glasgow uh, in November this year. Um, and the focus for this year really is on turning those 2050 promises into 2030 targets. Um, 2030 is short term in, in climate timelines, I'm, I'm uh, rapidly learning. Um, and particularly in the UK's case, having set a really ambitious um, uh, challenge of cutting emissions by 68% by 2030, um, Scotland has a, uh, will have an even more uh, aggressive um, equivalent target because its net zero target is for 2045, so five years before the UK. The really important thing for this year is turning that into policies and steps that businesses and households can respond to uh, in order to capitalise on the reductions in emissions that we had last year by accident of not being able to travel uh, and turning large parts of the economy off uh, and making those, uh, uh, making those gains more sustainable uh, and really re-engineering the economy post-COVID around uh, a greener uh, and more dynamic plan uh, to ensure that growth is sustainable uh, from, where, from where we go from here. So um, on top of digitization and the cha spatial changes we expect to see as a result of COVID, um, the greening of our economy is the other uh, mega trend, uh, which is well worth your time um, in engaging with and understanding and uh, ensuring that you or is best adopted by your business to the maximum extent possible so that'll put you in the best uh, best place for uh, to engage with the growth that we see from here onwards so with that i will thank you very much for your attention uh, i will if my mouse control allows me stop showing my screen uh, and i'd be um uh, delighted to take any questions uh, that you have and i think i'm handing over to uh, neil to be the quiz master for that stage yes thanks very much seb that was um fascinating as ever it's always great to get your insights and um and hear more about the the, the outlook for for the year ahead i guess first question for me given the uncertainty that covid still brings and and even around you know cop 26 is we're hoping is still going to happen in november face to face what sort of impact do, do you think that the the continuing presence of covid on the horizon is going to have on on the economic outlook and particularly in the in the kind of gloomier scenario where we we end up still in lockdown 4.0 5.0 later in the year and um, how do you see that that kind of playing out and impacting on our ability to to tackle these big issues like like climate yeah so i think um i think covid's lasting impact will can through once we get to the summer um, I think be increasingly disproportionately borne uh, by a smaller number of sectors and industries. Um, so, and what I mean by that is, you know, we will that we will be at a point there where it will be safe to have you know, schools back open for restaurants to operate with. You know, sensible spacing and good good sanitizing um, uh, facilities uh, and what have you so large parts of that side of the economy will be able to operate with new protocols but but not fundamentally changed business models even if they do permanently do a bit more takeaway and um, it will be much harder for you know, mass participation events um uh big scale recreation and um long haul travel um, uh, and people receiving the economic benefits of those who do long haul travel to get here. Um, that is a definitely the longest um, uh, recovery trajectory that, that we have, because this is a global phenomenon. We are very fortunate to be in the UK um, uh, by virtue of being a rich country has bought its way towards the top of the queue for vaccines um, as well as having contributed to some, some of the people who have not developed them. Um, uh, but yeah, the, there will be a lot of COVID circulating around the world for many, many years to come uh, and, um, and, and, and many epidemiologists 
um, are of the view that this is not this is not smallpox. This is not something we will eradicate. This will be a permanently circulating uh, circulating disease, um, even with the best vaccination you know, will in the world. So, um, so it, it is something which is going to um, have a very long and lasting effect on a on a tail uh, uh, on that long term on businesses, um, and therefore. Yeah, and that those sorts of adaptations, I think people need to people need to be realistic about what that what that new normal for those businesses look like uh, in order to put themselves on a sustainable footing. Great, thanks for that. And, and I, a question we've got from one of our um, audience members that's, that's associated to that, Sandy McKenzie, who we've had speaking previously um, at, at these sessions, has asked, how do you anticipate the government will balance the books after COVID and what effects do you anticipate on the economy? Yeah, um, so uh, a topic close to Rishi Sunak's heart because he's going to be doing a budget in, in March, um, which he I think he hoped to be a post-COVID bu budget too, but um, uh, but will be um, on, on eve of lockdown release, I think, um, judging, by the, judging by the way the forecasts are going. Um, there will be, um, so the, I think my first comment will be, this episode has shown just how powerful government intervention at on previously unprecedented scale in peacetime you know, it can be. So at, it, at its peak point, we had 8.9 million people being paid by the state not to go to work. And that is you know, just a situation that no one ever thought that we would be in. Um, but it, it furlough worked. So it, the numbers tick back up because of the because of new lockdowns, etc. But actually, the number of people who furloughed in October fell had fallen to two million. So for roughly seven million out of that nine to get their jobs back um, is actually a fantastically successful um, uh, retention scheme. As the as the title landed, so there is a newly, um, rightly um, recognised boldness to policy, willingness to spend money when you can have that sort of impact. Because actually, that's what allows this snap back um, to much close to pre-COVID levels of output, um, creating the bridge to that new level of uh, of activity is um, is the cheapest thing to do in the long term. But there will be a level of permanent damage. That much, that much is clear, um, and um, I think we'll only see attempts to recalibrate to that, i.e., put taxes up and, and and lean down on spending, when the Treasury has a much much greater sense of how big that hole is, because the risks of acting early and going down the kind of austerity downward spiral that we saw in in the eurozone crisis. Um, and, and many people would, would accuse the UK of having done in the post financial crisis too. Um, the risks of that are um, are very acute um, uh, and could make the situation worse by making temporary sh shocks more permanent. So the Bank of England will buy will buy the government time by continuing to hoover up as many gilts as it issues uh, into the market um, to give breathing space. Um, but yeah, uh, it'll be it'll be next year before we really before we really attempt to grapple that. Great, thanks for that. Um, another question that's on a similar theme, but a, a slight build. Um, unfortunately, it's an anonymous attendee, but um, it, the question is, is the impact of Brexit going to be totally masked by COVID? Um, and, and would you have a view on the economic impact of having this kind of slim trade agreement? And, and how will that flush out alongside the impact of COVID on the economy? Uh, okay, so um two two sets of effects to talk about here um we did lots of pre-covid we did a lot of brexit deal or no deal modeling um and lots of that um looked like cliff edge effects with no deal and disruption um uh, followed by longer term effects where a more distant trading relationship and lower net migration results in a smaller economy um, with less of a competitive um, uh, uh, restraint on, on it um, by virtue of a more distant trading relationship to our nearest, uh, nearest neighbours and therefore 
a uh, lower productivity growth um, uh, model for the economy. And though those effects still broadly hold, the fact that it's a thin trade agreement rather than a very comprehensive um, uh, and a close relationship means that we um, do expect it to be harder for um, UK and Scottish based businesses to sell into the Europe and therefore limit their, their growth potential somewhat versus, versus the alternative. Um, uh, and um, therefore we expect slightly less investment, we expect slightly less innovation uh, and slightly less growth to, to come from that. Um, you are right in that those effects show up in the statistics, but only normally over really quite a very long time. So we're talking about a gap between this versus the sort of arrangement that Theresa May was proposing, maybe of kind of two to three percent of GDP after 10 years. You know, what we're seeing with COVID is that a one month lockdown can, I'll update you tomorrow at 7am, but a one month lockdown you know, probably means the economy shrinks by two, two and a half percent. Uh, something to that stage, so that that ten year impact, you know, arriving all today in in, you know, in one month, and against that backdrop, it's you know um, it does get blown out of the water. Um, uh, to be frank, um, so yeah, it's going to be very hard to uh, to tease out the Brexit impact. I think the area you're going to be able to see it most strongly, and again, there is COVID in here too, is actually in the in the people side. So what does post Brexit net migration to the UK look like because that was a big source of labour supply for UK businesses uh, pre-COVID and a big source of their growth. Excellent, thanks for that. Um, I think I'm going to slightly change the subject slightly away from um, COVID if we can. So we've got a question here um, around the RBS PMI reports that were issued earlier in the week and um, this attendee is, is expressing some surprise that the December 2020 readings for business activity across the regions were pretty much in line with December 2019. Um, do you share that surprise? And with, with Brexit and fresh lockdowns kicking in, do we expect that to, to downturn? And by the time we get to December 2021, we'll, we'll really see the impact of that? Yeah, so I think... Um... The, the PMI shows are, are, are fascinating insights into, into how businesses are feeling. Um, they require a bit more careful interpretation during such acute shocks as we're seeing at the moment. So um, what looks like a good score for December, um, you know, for much of the UK, for, my, for many businesses around the UK, was more of a relief bounce from what November felt like. Um, uh, and therefore it, it probably tells us more on what's happening on a month by month basis than it does comparing to, to previous points in, uh, in the year, I think. So yeah, I would, um, uh, I'd keep it, keep it more limited on the, on the month to month comparisons to make sure you, um, you're getting the right interpretation from that. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, and another question from an anonymous, uh, attendee, um, on a, completely different um, angle or, or hopefully a different angle and um, with Bitcoin house prices and stock markets hitting record levels despite all the bad health bad news and um, the, the, the attendees asking is this a rational exuberance or or you know we always say it's, it'll be different this time should we be concerned about that in terms of horizon the horizon view yeah so I think we'll take those individually. Um, uh, house prices, um, the housing market has been a, a pleasantly surprise, surprisingly strong um, performer through the through this experience. Clearly benefiting from stamp duty holiday, but also benefiting from, uh, I suspect, uh, a lot of people being forced to spend more time with their um, with their partners and cohabitees, uh, and therefore actually able to take decisions about where they want to be um, or what they want to do um, in the near in the near future, and therefore therefore acting on them. It's definitely been a time of com contemplation for quite a lot of people, um, so we're seeing a rush of uh, of a lot of that, and that shows up in the trends of of what people are buying. So yeah, it, it, it 
it follows naturally, but it's always fun to see it. So sort of see it in the data. Um, you know, people are searching more uh, accurately for places with gardens so that they can spend time outside um, and for uh, for properties that have um, a space that they can use as an office um, uh, rather than perching on the edge of the bed um, uh, whilst they're working from home. So um, I, there's a combination of effects there, um, but uh, I, I think the, the fact that Unfortunately, yeah, COVID's um, negative economic impacts have been concentrated amongst those who aren't playing a meaningful uh, role in setting house prices in the UK, i.e. they tend to be renters, um, uh, has meant that the market has been insulated from a lot of the, a lot of the pain that we expected it probably would have received um, uh, going back to what, what we were expecting 10 months or so ago. So yeah, that's been a much, much stronger performance. Um, and um, uh, Bitcoin is a is a peculiar one. I um, don't profess to hold any forecasting power over uh, over that. Um, uh, but yeah, if you, as some people do, see it as a um, a haven against the the kind of scourge of um, uh, current traditional currencies that governments and central banks are capable of debasing by just printing, then the current situation where you have central banks printing astonishing amounts of uh, currency more rapidly than they have had them before, um, there is a, a, a logical coherence to therefore uh, those people um, uh, continuing to put more value on it, um, even if it's role as actually a currency used for transactions is still limited by the fact it's it's actually pretty slow and clunky for an electronic currency compared to um even compared to current, uh, uh, traditional currencies um so yeah not not a huge surprise to see that hitting new heights but as ever with um uh, with anyone who looks at the value chart for it be prepared to lose um uh, at very short notice a very large amount of what you put in or or maybe even make it again in as many days uh, if you if you choose to engage with that great thanks for that and um, keep the questions coming if anyone's got any more just use the q a function and we'll try and get through as many as we can i know we've still got a few here and um, there's one from rakesh gupta who's asking early in 2020 we were talking about a, a w curve and now it looks more like a an m curve in terms of recovery and um, he's asking for your view as to whether or not we're likely to see that shift again or or or, or how you expect that to play out yeah um i think my favorite is the reverse square root um but i won't try and draw any more any more graphical analogies um when we are through this latest lockdown touch wood um I think we will have a smoother progression back to growth because I think, and I have a hope, that this will be the last time that genuine critical care health service capacity is, 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 is at present and urgent danger of being fundamentally overwhelmed, which, is, which was the trigger uh, uh, for this, this set of policies. Um, I think that we will rapidly be able to get back to within three or 4% of where we were uh, pre-COVID. But I think the remaining two to 3% is gonna be very hard fought because people are not gonna be traveling as much as they were. They are not gonna be um, engaging in the same ways. And we're going to have to try to re-engage our customers um, uh, in different ways in, in order to uh, in order to um, part them from their money and uh, and uh, give people the sorts of experiences and uh, that they want that they want to spend that they want to spend their money on um, in a, in a context of far fewer people moving around the globe um, now that could still be a better sort of welfare and economic outcome there's nothing inherently bad about that but it takes adjustment um, and adjustment is a fairly crude economic term that captures you know, people and businesses stopping doing what they were doing before and doing something else instead. Um, and that can that can feel very, very tough for the people directly affected by that. 
so yeah i'm optimistic about getting back the majority of the activity but i think it's going to be um hard fought for uh, um uh, for that for, uh, for that final part great thanks for that and i think we've got time for one more quick one um first one i'm seeing on the screen here is from david may who says great presentation seb thank you a couple of questions what are your views on inflation and government debt and how will digitalization and environment impact uk productivity almost made it without misusing <laughs> that. um uh so uh on inflation um we we think outside of uh we think overall this is a, a disinflationary environment so and you can see that across most most economies particularly in europe um in, inflation has been falling uh, there are pockets where high demand for certain goods or services um causes causes uh, prices to rise but overwhelmingly this this is disinflationary as demand is sucked out of the economy by um uh, by the restrictions um in terms of government debt um there's going to be a lot more of it about for a lot longer uh, period of time um, uh, but so far markets have taken that in their stride largely because central banks have been buying up the, the net flow so private investors haven't actually had to own any more government debt than they than they did before um, the interesting challenge will be when um, uh, central banks feel comfortable starting to bleed that back out into the markets they won't be in any hurry to do that at all um, but that will be a very carefully um, calibrated judgment when it when it does arrive. Um, uh, and then finally, on the, the point about um, uh, digitization uh, uh, of growth, yeah, I I think that we can use that step change in digitization to do things better. Um, you know, talking to my team narrowly, um, uh, which is 50-50 between um, Edinburgh and India, you know, we feel that there has been a democratizing element to um, the fact that we were always on Zoom um, uh, and, that, um, and that we were able to work more effectively um, when we deploy the right techniques and tools um, uh, to do that. Um, it allows me to do many more of these types of events uh, as part of uh, as part of my job um, and stay in staying rather fewer uh, premier inns on the outskirts of motorway service stations away from my family um, uh, while I'm doing so. So yeah, I'm, I'm thankful that I can take um, those kind of positives out from the way that I do my business and, uh, uh, and engage with my, my team and, and my job. Um, and I think the important thing is for, for everyone to try to understand how they can capture and capitalize on those sorts of aspects uh, in order to increase our productivity and do things in a way which um, which leaves us and the environment in a uh, uh, in a more in a more sustainable state um because uh, really that has to be um uh, one of the lessons that we take uh, opportunities that we take to to change the habits habits of the, of the past uh, as we grow grow through into the fourth in the future Great, thanks very much for that. Ending on a, a positive aspirational note. So um, yes, thanks for all your questions. Sorry we couldn't get through them all. And um, we'll pass back to Helen to uh, close the session. Am I on mute? That's you now. No, oh, that's me now. Right, OK. Um, thanks very much, Neil. Sorry, I, I failed to introduce you earlier. Um, Neil, um, as part of our committee, and um, he very kindly um, organised tonight's event. He's put a lot of hard work into it, and um, I think you'll all agree it's been um, a really enjoyable event. So um, thank you very much, Seb, for um, agreeing to take part. And um, thank you, everyone, for the questions that you've submitted, um, which have really um, exceeded all expectations, really. Um, our next district committee event um, will be restricted to local district members, I'm afraid. It's our, it'll be our AGM in early March. Um, it will be posted on the, the Institute's website for local members to, to just keep an eye out and um, you're more than welcome to come and join us. We're hoping to have um, our 
annual interprofessional quiz, which again is a local event um, virtually. So we'll see how our planning goes with that. Um, but just keep an eye on our, our, our LinkedIn page. Uh, are you not already a member of the group, then please send us an invite. And um, thank you very much for, for joining us. And I'll pass you on to Heather. Thank you all for joining today's webcast and for all your excellent questions. They were really great. And um, we hope you found today's session of value. For members of the Chartered Banker Institute, today's webcast will count as part of your ongoing CPD and you can log this in the members area of the website. I'd like to say a big thank you to Sebastian and the District Centre and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>